Hello and welcome everyone to this discussion on the physical and technical returns of futsal. The plan today is to talk about this in three areas really. Uh, they'll all interconnect as the discussion unfolds I'm sure but essentially we're going to look at the constraints of futsal. So the rules, the environment it's played in and such like and then link to that what technical and predominantly physical returns you get as a result of these constraints. And then that'll take us into the coaching skills that you need in order to identify these outcomes um, and then in order to help the players as individuals from there. Uh, discussing this today, we're fortunate to have a range of experience across the panel. My name's Ian Parks. I'll be hosting. I'm an FA youth coach developer with a responsibility for supporting clubs and coaches who use futsal as part of their academy programmes. We've got Mike Skubala from a futsal perspective who the head coach of the England national futsal team. Uh, from a football perspective, we've got Paul McGuinness, another FA coach developer with great experience supporting some of Manchester United's brightest talents through their youth. And also Matt Portas, who is physical performance education lead, I think is your title, Matt. <laughs> and he'll be helping us from a physical perspective, I'm sure. So I think it's probably best to start with the constraints of futsal and see how the technical and physical returns drop out of that. So, Scoobs, do you want to get us started? Yeah, hi, gents. How are you doing? Good, good afternoon. How are you? Yeah, good, thanks. Thanks, good. Parksy. Um, yeah, well, I suppose, I think before we sort of, you know, get into some more deeper discussions, it'd be good. I always think it's good to go through what, what the game of futsal is probably giving you as a, as a return, as a coach. And sometimes it, it looks quite fluid. It looks quite messy. Um, but I think once you break it down, you know, we broke it down in this slide into to five pillars, if you like. Um, and if we talk around the constraints and what the constraints of the game gives the player, I think that's a great starting point to sort of get underneath the wheels of probably futsal, the physical returns and the coach and how coaches can use it. So, you know, if you look at that, we talk about a goal and in, in futsal, we said there's five key pillars really to make it proper, if you like. Um, the goal, the laws of the game, the surface, the ball and, and uh, the law, sorry, and the not playing to line. So, you know, if you look at the goal, it's three by two metres, which effectively means that you have to get the ball closer to the goal in order to score. So it's a lot harder to score from distance other than, other than through power, really. So that's one area that is the goal is one of a constraint of itself. And I know football uses many goals for, for similar reasons, but um, the laws of the game, you know, the laws of the game are quite unique, which is different to football, where to give you one law, for example, you can't go back to the keeper um, until it's been touched by a defender. So that puts the player in a situation that I'm sure Paul and, and Matt will get onto later where, you know, they can't they can't pass it off a wall. They can't go back to the keeper. So all of a sudden, he, he's into a situation where he's got to be able to deal with the ball, the ability to face forward, those types of things where conventional five-a-side, you would pass backwards uh, and you go back to the keeper. So it creates situations and scenarios for players that I think are quite quite demanding. Uh, again, we spoke about the lines. You know, typical five-a-side will play off the lines. Foot south plays two lines so for me that's that's more like football in, in terms of playing to an area and then the, the other two just to to link on is obviously the ball the futsal ball you know it's it's not heavier it's denser which basically means from a physical point of view it accelerates really quickly uh, and then slows down for, for ease of control which is slightly different mechanics to a football and then the hard surface so generally you know at tiers of futsal you know futsal to be plays indoors um, but generally we say it needs to be played on a hard surface so the ball and the surface coupled together make the game quite quick. The way I try and use the analogy is it's a bit like playing football on a on a, a, a dew or wet surface where the ball zips around a little bit. And, you know, that can make the game really, really fast. So you put those constraints together and you start to kick out some really interesting numbers. Like it's like playing 37 v 37 on a, a football pitch, um, five or six times quicker in terms of the speed in which the ball can move at the top level of a game. You know, we even talk about the difference between a wooden surface and a, a rubber surface at the top level because the wooden surface, the ball skids rather than rolls. So when you start to think about the constraints of futsal in this way and you start to dig deeper into it, I think there's some huge um, player development terms, really. Guys, I don't know what you think about that because you know, there's some loads of information there. So, Shall we start with the, you mentioned the not passing back to the goalkeeper. I guess that creates 1v1s. Should, should we start with that as, and the physical and technical returns you get from the, the number of 1v1s? Paul, do you want to kick us off with some of the, maybe the technical returns of a, a 1v1 that you're going to get? 
Yeah, I think so. And also, of course, there's, there's not so much space to run in behind or to create space wide. You're always within a close contact uh, contact of an opponent. So body work, body positioning and um, working close and manipulating the ball under contact is a big part of the game. And that's why it's also a great um, learning tool uh, to, to go into football, um, you know, close contact and and um, being able to manipulate your body, rearrange it quickly uh, at close range and control the ball are, are vital parts of the game. And from you, Matt, from a physical perspective, 1v1, we talked about a lot of body contact there. How does that compare maybe to the game of football? Yeah, well, clearly the number of players on the pitch and the amount of 1v1s that you get is going to increase the amount of contact. Um, so, one, you've You've got to become more skilled at getting your body in a position where it's strong and stable to be able to res res potentially resist your opponent, uh, to work against your your opponent. Um, but equally, it, you know, if you've made a decision where you you maybe see an opportunity to get past your opponent, you've got to obviously, from a, a psychological point of view, use that like deception, but. Once you decide to go in a certain direction, you've got to have the agility, the the body coordination and the power to be able to do that quickly, to be able to get around your opponent. So there's, you know, there's massive amounts of physical uh, benefit in, in exposing players to lots of 1v1 play, which clearly futsal does. So Scoobs, we're talking about 1v1s. I'm guessing there's a lot of different types of 1v1 in a, in a game of futsal. I see the picture here. It's uh, more of a hold-up play. And we talked about being able to shield the ball is that yeah i think i think if you, yeah if you go back to the laws of the game you you, you can play futsal with rolling subs so straight away you know it becomes a high intensity sport for me um and that way you've got the small number work and the connections and combination of ones two threes and ultimately to the fours but because of um like you say because of the one the difference in one v ones could be you know the ability to land forward on it is key and the ability to then make it like matt says make a right decision under speed whether you drag and drag and drop and go one v one, whether you bring other players into combined, whether you you know you're working in less space, so the, the we call it molding the space. How do you mold the space to be able to play forward? How do you how do you use that space? How do you own that space in order to to get to your next level, to get to the next stage? So, I think there's so much going on for an individual player, and when you get the lens on top of that player to look at what they have to actually do in futsal, I think there's some some real good. Um, fast returns and good strong returns um, but even just you know even just like Matt was saying even just the ability to hold players off when the ball comes into you and you can't create any more or mould any more space to face forward it's a very very contact sport and I think sometimes there's a misconception that foot sells you know for small kids or for, for people that aren't very physical but we're talking about lots and lots of contact <coughs> in, in the indoor game really Good so we talked about um, it's tight and there's not much space. Paul, from a technical perspective, what would you be looking for outcome-wise in terms of if they're trying to create space? You know, there's going to be more moving and fainting, I'd imagine. Yeah, I think it's very much a game where um, it is man for man a lot of the time. So you have to prepare your space against your direct opponent, and in in that way, uh, a lot of the work I've been doing recently on we called it one v one tactics, but of course it's all relative to the other players on the pitch. But in that actual duel, you must know your own strengths. So I've been going around to a lot of the clubs. One of the best clubs uh, for giving feedback has been um, Tottenham, where they've got some staff with a lot of um, a lot of league experience. Um, so, say for instance, I was doing a, a session where I was saying you have to you have to um, come back in and back into an opponent, and you had Ryan Mason who, who said, well. Yeah, that's that's okay for a bigger guy, but for me, I couldn't do it like that because physically I wasn't strong enough. I would have to come off and, and use my body and maybe turn. So in, in all of this, we know that it's very good for individual duels, but it's also very good for for players to understand their own strengths and weaknesses. Because like you, like Scoob's just said, I've seen the, the international game of um of futsal, there's some massive guys playing six foot two, three with high skills, and then some smaller guys as well. It's not just small guys, so you have to know how to play against that opponent. In that sense, it's it's, it's very much where all the four corners are in it together. So the intelligence of the player, the psychology to plan ahead, create his space. So he might be against a big guy. Can he come off and get space? 
um, and then turn and run at him? Or can he use the, the opponent's power coming towards him and slip it past him quickly and flow against his movement the, the opposite way? So in all of this, I think it's a great game for people to understand and, and practice and try out their own strengths and weaknesses against different types of opponents. Because right, I guess for Scoob's futsal, you know, there's a lot of interchanging positions, rotations and what have you. So players are going to be finding themselves in different um, areas of the pitch. So therefore exposed to different 1v1s that way. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I think yeah, I think that as you as you if you go through the foundation to youth development to to professional development, I think it's there's a similar model in futsal as the football. You know, at a younger age, the kids would play a lot more um, in all positions, rotate, move, get on the ball in loads of different ways. As Paul said, try and outwit your opposite man, try and outwit your opposite pair. A lot of paired work, a lot of threes work in combination plays. And then as you get to an older and more performance area, that they become what I call eighty twenty. So you become more sort of position specific and there's more specificity around the role. So, you know, futsal could give a number nine a lot of good traits in football if we played in them as what we call the pivot or the top man because the way you use your body, the way you roll, the way you try and get on it. So I think there's there's lots of interchanging of positions because of the nature of the game, the speed of the game. So you have to, you know, fill spaces to get on the ball. You have to then try and penetrate in behind. You have to combine to get all the stuff that we see in football. But then, actually, there is different traits that you need in in futsal as well. So, like like Paul was saying, you know, you might be a a player that is quick and can get around the place. So you'd be more likely to play as on the wing. If you're a good receiver and passer and you can move the ball like a number four, you're probably more likely to be a be a defender or a, a fix or a backman for us. But actually, you still need the other bits. You still need the physical bits to roll out of things. You still need the bits to to you know, have good passes through lines. So I think it just really gives players instant, quick feedback of whether they can do it or not, or whether they have the potential of doing it or not. I think one thing that's interesting there, when I go around the clubs, talking about playing different footballers in different futsal positions. So because there's no offsides in futsal, people have often naturally, they play their number nine, their striker up as the target player in a futsal game. But actually, you challenge them to say, what if you played your number 10 in that position and play behind their deepest player, their back man, if you like? So then you can get different returns there. And then you're moving off on, uh, is it horizontal, side to side, as, as well as forwards and backwards? Because I think that's something that we see a lot in futsal, isn't it? There's more side to side movement that you can encourage to get into spaces, whereas a lot of football sometimes at young ages is in straight lines. Matt, from your perspective, physically, we've talked there's going to be a lot of change in direction to create this space. What does that mean for accelerations and decelerations? Yeah, well, clearly, because of the, the area size that you're playing in, the number of players, the speed of the game, you're going to get a lot more opportunity to practice accelerating and decelerating because the space is tighter. You're probably not going to see players hitting top speed, but they're going to hit lots uh, lots more axels, D cells within a game of futsal. Um, so the implications of that are twofold, really. Uh, one is you are going to become more skilled and practiced at breaking and, and, and changing direction in, re in, re in re response to a stimulus. So that stimulus being your direct opponent or the movement of the opposition or of one of your teammates. Um, but the more exposed you get to that in a kind of the random way that you will get in it within a futsal game, the more skilled and efficient your body will be get, becoming in that. That then, in, in a football point of view, transfers across, across to those um, tight spaces that we need players to play in sometimes, particularly in and around uh, the penalty area at, at both ends of the field, where, again, space is congested. There might be an individual battle you've got to win. But ultimately, the, the movement will be um, accelerating, breaking and, and changing direction in a tight, tight space. So you're developing the player's agility and you're developing uh, their capability to do that. So building their body's capability, but you're also making the body more efficient in that sort of movement because it learns how to do it. Brilliant. Yeah, I think, partly just to add to, to Matt there, I think it's like for the foundation phase, Matt, I don't know. If you agree? It's a bit like playing a different sport if you're a kid, where you're having the indoor sort of approach. So we talk about you, kids should play basketball, kids should play handball. I agree with all playing different sports, but actually, a kid if a kid was playing futsal as well as football, 
the physical returns and the agility side of things that they'll be getting would be you know growing that strength in their body in relation to a football stimulus is is is, is, is quite important i think is is what you could get as well from from that age group what do you think about that Matt? No, I absolutely agree with that. I think that that's a really, really important point to make. The other thing that came to my mind as well that, that you talked about earlier, Mike, was about the surface. And I think that has a really important part to play in the physical development of players. Um, the hard surface allows, again, potentially um, more adaptation in terms of power production because it's a hard surface. You're able to spring off that surface more. So from a physical point of view, the body needs to adapt. If it's if it's being asked to change direction on a hard surface compared to a grass surface, and again that could have real physical benefits for for the developing player. I know yeah, we talked so about I, that. I, the, the, I was just going to say, and also the added the added value to that for me is the the amount of transitions you get in the game. So, you know, if you talk about the constraints of the game around the laws and also the sizes. And I know Matt probably agrees with this. So that adaptation is coming from a real stimulus around lots and lots of transitions that happen in futsal. Um, whereas you can have long periods of possession in football. You do in futsal if it's if it's outmatched. But actually, if it's a close game, there's there's generally more transitions in the game. Yeah, just like the X cells and D cells, you're going to see an an increase in the number of uh, of transitions. So that the speed of play generally, the game pace is higher. Um, that means that the play, because you've got the rotating subs and the speed of play, it's a real opportunity from a physical point of view to develop those really high intensity elements of play. And those high, high intensity elements of play from a football point of view require you to, to utilise the anaerobic system and, 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 get, and develop that speed endurance capability. Um, and, that, and that's what, that's what futsal will bring you, you know, what you know, one to two minutes of really intense, high intensity activity, whether it's changing direction, axel, d cell, uh, whether that's kind of in possession and then transitioning and having to recover. Um, with, with the transitions, probably you'll see transitions of players having to move kind of five to 25 metres, accelerating, breaking, changing direction. So it, it's really working again on those high intensity, short axel, d cells that we'll see in the in the business end of the field in, in football as well brilliant and you've talked about the foundation phase at times and what about youth development is, where would futsal fit in terms of growth spurts and kids going through maturation at different points any thoughts on that matt yeah well i think i think similar to the football program really it, you know um it may be that we need to think about where individuals are at, particularly the youth phase is a, a real challenging one, as we know, because um, you, you could have some kids who are biologically uh, in the same age group uh, to play football, but their bodies biologically are maybe three or four years apart. Um, and that, that means that they require different programs to help them to continue develop their football education. Now, it might be that a player that's really struggling because they're uh, they haven't gone through their growth spurt yet um, might really thrive in a in a court that is quite tight and you, you don't have to cover the high distances but the kids got a good touch and they've got good vision and um, you can maybe play them in an area of the of the the court in futsal that um, where they can still impact the game without having to make the kind of the large transitions that some of the more developed players might make. But equally, the other way around, you know, we really need to push our early developers and it might be that um, futsal provides that higher intensity hit that their body is now ready to adapt to because they've gone through puberty, there's more muscle, there's more testosterone flushing around, their, uh, their energy systems are kind of really developed and thriving because they've gone through puberty and it might be that we can use futsal to really push that anaerobic capacity that will help them with their game pace in football as well yeah brilliant i thought i, I think they no, go on paul yeah just on that one and i mean people seem to think oh it's just for futsal and indoor football is just for the younger age groups whereas in fact my my finding was it's great all the way through. So take, for instance, the under-18 group 
I had with Marcus Rashford in, we were particularly working on him on forward movement and, and movements of a centre forward. Before that, he was a winger or a number 10. And we used a tournament in Germany, a, a six-a-side tournament, but very similar to futsal with all the, all the constraints. We did have the boards, uh, but, but the, the same idea that you, 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 you had the opportunity to get a certain amount of moves or pictures that would, would happen regularly. So one particular one was receiving with back to goal and with his studs, like you would do as the pivot in in futsal, and at first he couldn't quite get it. He was not what he what he was doing was not coming and hitting the guy first, getting getting planted, and then getting his studs up. He was still moving when he was when he was receiving the ball. So that physical and technical element together to go step back, take the hit, bump him, then get a solid base in order to then control and cushion the ball was really important. And I think in one, just in one game, he would get six or seven chances to do that, control it with his studs, dummy to go one way, roll the other. So that movement pattern, which was new to him, and physical movement pattern, then started, you could see actually during the tournament how much better it got and how much smoother it got throughout the tournament. And he then started to use it in the 11 aside games. So we, in all of these uh, things, and that wasn't the only thing, opening up his hips, coming up and opening up, so these physical movements, these both technical but also physical movements that you want to uh, get automated and really flow, they you can get such a a, a clear picture in, in the futsal and in the small-sided games and, of course, a lot of repetition. That's why they're so useful, you know? Yeah, yeah I, would, I was yeah, going to say, we've seen... Yeah. Go on, sorry, Pops. I was just going to bring you in and say... We've seen examples, haven't we, in the haven't you, in the England programme of players coming in at kind of fourteen, fifteen, and using futsal alongside their football to go on to do some good things. Yeah, I think it's it's slowly changing. And some of the younger players, I think, because of the digital age, see more futsal online and and across the world, and obviously other players that have grown up on it that that probably aspiring footballers, if you like, some of the world class players. But I think linking back to Paul's point, for me, it, it gives really clear, quick feedback to an individual player, and I think the reason for that is. Like we've talked about the physical element, but if you were to, you know, in the youth development phase, you're working on being a high pressing team and you go indoors and you high press. If you get that action, tactical action wrong, you pretty much can be punished. So some of the challenges we've had sometimes with some good level footballers coming in might be that they, they might be good at pressing, but they get the detail wrong that Paul's talking about in terms of tactics. Um, they get opened up and it can be a goal within four seconds. So the responsibility, the ownership of the nine out of possession as well as in possession it gives you so quick feedback and actually players go Woof, this is this is this puts me in that not pressure cooker i want to call it a pressure cooker but <clears> it's not really pressure. it's more about the responsibility of the, the the real detail and technical detail and tactical detail that that improves players and i think uh, uh, the youth development phase that's when they start needing that that little bit more yeah. i think so parksy as well exactly what scoobs is saying it's very clear, you know, this in, in the 11 side, or oh, the ball could have gone off somewhere else, and then you miss the chance to get that that learning. But it's that self-learning of a model you might have. But also, you get the opportunity, because it's so intense, the players have to rotate. So they're on for two, three minutes, whatever, and then they come off. Now you've got a little chance as the coach to just say, oh, that was a great little turn there. What, what was it that, that got you the turn? And he can say, well, yeah, I see it's a moving screen. He's going to get the ball there. He goes towards it. He gets the defender flowing with him. And as if he's going to intercept it, but he gets, say, it's coming to his right foot. He gets his left leg across, blocks him with that. Then he lets it run across his body, gets his arm out and blocks him across the other way. And you get that feedback very quickly. And if, say, it doesn't go quite right, you can just as easily ask them on the side, well, what happened that time? And he says, oh, well, I timed it wrong. You know, and the guy got in front. So the, there's a real feedback, both physically and from the the perception and feel point of view, but also from the coaching point of view on the side. Yeah, and I think you know, I, I, I really support the, the point that Paul made about the all the way through the program because one of the one of the complaints that we have sometimes about the pro development phase program, for example, is that. The, the gap between the pace of the game at the under 18s and under 23s and senior football is huge. 
Now, if, if we expose players to playing futsal and the speed of the game here from a physical and a thinking point of view, and then the responsibilities that they have to take and the opportunities that they, they get to practice certain skills uh, about beating their direct opponent at speed uh, competitively, um, I think you know that's a really important piece that might be missing from uh, some PDP programs. Um, and then to take it back into the youth development stuff, I think you know when we talk about the kids going through their growth and things like that, often the, their movement skills um, almost regress a little bit. So those their, their ability to change direction, to coordinate. So again, it comes back to that repetition of skill uh, at that phase to be able to maybe uh, relearn some of the movements that they could do quite competently pre-puberty. And this obviously affects kids individually and differently, um, but some of them might need some a bit of extra help to develop the skills around kind of movement and using their body and getting stable and being able to use their arms and, uh, and, and, and coordinate everything so that they're holding their opponent off. All of those things, uh, the more you practice it, the better the body gets at it in terms of skill development. So from an efficiency point of view, we become better at doing it. Um, but also the body doesn't the body doesn't like to fatigue so the more that we practice this stuff at high speed the fitter the body becomes to, to learn how to adapt to that because it doesn't like to get fatigued and damaged and that's what that's what building fitness is and it's a great opportunity through play um, to build fitness which isn't often you know when we talk about building physical capability in players um, that element it comes from doing drills or off-field practices or isolated work well there's some great opportunities within foot futsal where the intensity is really high the competitiveness is really high to be able to do a lot of that stuff through play i think the um the interesting thing there for me is like well, there's there is opportunity to get players off but at times in futsal you could be right under the caution for three or four minutes you're working at on average of 90 percent of your heart rate max while you're on as it, as matt says so actually, there's, there's a bit in the youth development phase and pre how you manage yourself whilst under fatigue, technically, tactically, is where I see some real good returns for sort of that, that middle ages, Matt, as well. So I 100% agree with that. I've seen players that, you know, are flogging. We can't get them off tactically to make that change, but you've got to deal with it. You've got to deal with it for another minute. You might be, you know, because we have a similar principle of not subbing whilst, you know, we're defending. So you've got to deal with that bit for a minute and it's real high high demand there psychologically as well the learning then comes in well i can't do that anymore i can't close that space anymore because i i've gone i've gone physically but i still need to do something to stop this lot getting through and and help my teammates out because there's only there's only a small number of on the, on the court so it also teaches that well when i am fatigued how am i still useful to the team when i when yeah. i can't do what i would yes. normally so if you've been on so situation Paul, like you've been on for three minutes, you're absolutely fatigued. You're a top player. You've got to get back. You haven't got a choice because if you don't get back, you're a four v three, and it can result in a goal. So that feedback, if you don't do, you make that added, like you say, twenty meter run at pace to get in behind the line of the ball. Mm. You're gonna you you get, you're pretty much gonna concede, or, or you're definitely gonna let a shot off. So I think it's that responsibility of things. It's interesting. Yesterday when we spoke to Max, when we said, "Go on, then what's some of the three things you said?" He went speed intensity of futsal like intensity of premier league most coaches go to and i think it's a bit of an anomaly go to the sole control we're not sure about that and a part of that i think they miss they miss all the other stuff uh, max interestingly went to like you say matt um he went to intensity he went to speed and the replication around top level football and and futsal which was yeah good link yeah just for those listening to reference that um we spoke to max kilman a player who's twin tracked he picked futsal up at about 14 15 years old when he dropped out of the the pro academy uh, you'll be able to find that on youtube if you want to listen to that q a with him um he's ended up at Wolves now playing in the premier league and he actually said didn't he scoob yesterday that the europa league games, some of the europa league games he played in were slower than some of the futsal games he played in so i thought that was interesting um paul do you want to take us on to some of the tools that you've used to there's all this going on in a game of futsal it's really really quick it's all going on 100 miles an hour how do we as coaches um really look for 
something, one of these things, these outcomes to then help players with? Do you want to talk us through how you do it? Yeah, we've uh, we've used this on the A licence and I've been taking it around some clubs for CPD to say a lot of the time now well, there's a lot of good work going on in clubs and, and uh, on courses and stuff for 11 v 11, 4 3 3, high focus on positional play uh, in terms of tactics and strategies. But here we're very much looking at the but so, yeah, this isn't one v one because there's a two v one. But we're looking at that real duel, the marker and the and the guy against him. So we're looking at positional play. How do they create space in the small area on futsal, particularly? Uh, and and within that, looking at what they do before the ball comes, during, after. We're looking for key pictures and and key factors so that this would be a regular occurrence. The type of thing could happen if the blue was to come right over next to. The red on the left-hand side, that would leave a space inside, either a blindside run or a run across, um, a moving a screen across um, to get the ball on the other quadrant. So we've used that as a as a guide to really zoom in, put under the microscope the movements. And on the next slide, we, we're then saying, um, if you stick the next one up, Parksy. Yeah. Yeah, the next one we say, well, now for the physical aspect, we really got to zoom in right from head to the toe. And we've got to have real detail. And, and that's difficult because you can't look at everything at once. You've got to check one point out at a time. You have to um, um, apologise for my rough stick, man, but it does the job. And I think it says everybody can do that as well. Let's have a little look at it. Look at the head first because the head will tell you a lot of things. If he's not looking around, his feet are not likely to follow in the right way. So they've got to know beforehand what they're doing. Can you be looking at the arms? Do they get their arm across the guy? As they go past him, do they maybe block them off with the arm? Um, do they use their hips? Do they open up quickly? Do they get a thigh across in, across the player to block their run uh, or to, to shield the ball? And what's the footwork like? Is it side sidestepping? Is it crossover steps? Is it backwards quickly? How often are they square? Do they get quickly over the ground? Um, you know, if they've got a solid base? There's so many things to look at, but this is an, a, a nice way to zoom in and put it all under the microscope. And then you start to see if you look and you get best practice by looking at all the top players, you start to see. And of course, it's different for different types of body shape. And so it might be a big, tall guy uh, or a smaller guy. What, 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 how do they use their strengths against their opponent? And um, it's a way of really zooming in so that you've got the tools then to go and coach and give, um, give really the right information. And you'll find a lot of that then. I, I like to use the idea of. The body's a complex system, so we're trying to get stability in what we do, stability in our movements, and use that stability and try and unbalance your opponents. So you might get a, a sort of dragging the ball sideways and then check with a bit of disguise and then go quickly with a, a burst. So you've got a change of direction, a change of flow, getting the, getting the, the um, opponent moving to one part of the quadrant, then quickly go in the opposite way. Um, and that happens all the time in futsal. If he chases you quickly, you might do a stop turn, get your arm across him, and like Pete Sturgis uses it as a, an analogy, the, the revolving door to then revolve and spin out, get your leg back across him and use your body. So you're looking at all these ways within this quadrant to get a good idea of what's the coaching point you need, yeah. You know I what? think they... Sorry, Sorry Parks, I was, I was there, just say... to link, link back to futsal, mate, like... We, we talk about, we work in like perception phase quite a lot in coaching. You know, we talk about perception action or perception decision action. And what Paul's mentioning there, you know, when we're talking about pressing, we're talking about the pressing triggers being, you know, look at, look at the eyes, look at the hips first. As you approach that player with speed, you need as many triggers as you can because the game's so quick. And if you're giving off those, if your hips are closed to the game, we pretty much can go, go and attack passing lines quicker. So everything links in terms of the four corners because you're doing things at, at real high intensity, real high speed. And then the other thing, that, the slide before, which Paul was talking about, the four during and after. You know, one thing for me is if you, if you can't prepare your space before and you can assess what's going on and you can get yourself a metre, half a metre to face forward, um, you're not gonna you're not gonna do well in the game. You know the the action, the the during bit, the technical bit that people sort of hone in on quite a lot. I think is is key. But actually, I think the before and the after bits are really key. With with a real a real focus on before in possession, how you get on it is is absolutely vital. 
and changes of speed is Matt is part of that as well and direction. Yeah, just on that again, you know, it all links. You know, you can't just divorce, um, and that's why it's so important. You have the ball cues, you have the game. It's got to be game scenarios to get the best physical movements. There needs to be a perception and action coupling. So, you know, of course, you'll get gains from doing ladders and and and, and things through cones, but the real gains, I think are from doing something where it's linked to an actual game. So in that sense, like Scoobs is saying, you want to prepare that space, but then it's the timing when your pastor gets his head up, you've got eye contact. Now do you reveal the pass? You reveal the picture you want. So that's a quick burst, maybe off your man to drop off or to open up. And that reveals that communication then with your body language shows where you need the pass and the speed of the footwork, the quality of it, is going to make that pass work because in in that's the great thing about futsal the distances between the attacker and defender are so small it's just like say Firmino around the box playing in Salah you know the distance is so small so the time of the movement he reveals and the speed of the pass the accuracy is going to kill the opposition so it's the quality of the movements that are vital as, and the timing massively uh, you know this perceptual thing is huge and. You know, an, another benefit of playing a game that is played at such speed is that your decision making and the the action linked to that, you become more effective at at making those decisions more quickly. So that when you go back into the football environment, you can almost ramp up the intensity at which you're playing at because you've adapted to that. But I think from the physical point of view, Paul and I have have, have, have talked and and worked on the air license in the past around this. You know, this is a real great opportunity for the football coach. And if you are in an environment where you've also got a fitness coach or a, a physical specialist with you as well, this 1v1 stuff is a great way of, of, of those coaches collaborating to help the player. Because when Paul's talking about, well, once you've made the decision, do you spin off? Do you drop deep? What position do you put your hips in? How do you, where do you put your arm to hold the player off? How do you gain stability? How do you, how do you deceive, but then when you're ready to go, you move powerfully? Well, you know, we can we can work together to kind of make sure that the, the player has got the physical capabilities that underpin some of those things that are really essential in those 1v1 battles. I think another key, key point here as well that sometimes people don't recognise is you're going from real, real tension and power uh, production in your body and your movements for sprinting and so on and the, for the body contact where you've got to be tense against one you've got to hit them yeah. but in order to control a ball in football or futsal your body has to relax so you're yeah. going from tension to hit and hold the guy off to then just cushioning it with a very light touch so you have to be relaxed the body and this is one of the, again another great advantages of futsal and because in, in football you, you might have quite a, a longer time between contacts with the ball is that you're learning to have the real physical hard co um, uh, contact and tension in your body, but then also relax quickly. So from going, say, out of possession work to into possession work, relaxing the body is – and, of course, to do that, you have to relax the mind. Uh, you, but your mind's got to be relaxed in a sense or absorbed in, in, in all of this. So that's the other good thing. Kids don't want to be stopped all the time from playing. So the non-stop play absorbs you both physically and um, and mentally. There's a flow to you mentally, but there's yeah. also a physical flow to the game that gets you used to getting up and down and up and down in that intense uh, way. And, and you know, you, you're trying to cut out all the distractions. There's not any, much noise. A lot of the coaching comes... I know Scoops will be giving them different bits on the side, the high level, but a lot of the coaching comes from playing the game and then afterwards in the little breaks, I'm sure. Yeah. And also, the, the more you practice those things, Paul, the more the more skilled your body becomes at releasing that tension more quickly. So yeah. what, the, more you, the more you're familiar with them situations, the more you know your body learns when to use the muscle and when to use the physical force, but also it, it helps it to relax more quickly. So the more often you do that, the, the better you can focus on your touch and, and, the, and the more finesse elements of manipulating the ball as well. 
Yeah, we talk about, um, it's interesting because I was just listening to both and we actually talk about managing contact in the game. So at the high level, we talk about how you manage your self-contact. So, you know, there's different elements to this physical arm, this physical bit, like how do you use your body to, to kill your opposite man's speed? So one of the, one of the biggest things you can do in into people getting in behind you is that, well, how do you stop their acceleration? And then you can run with them. So sometimes you'll see actions in foot cell that and they're not fouls, but they're physical. You know, it's how you use your body in the best way. And that can be a shock sometimes to, to, to new people coming into foot cell of a high level because they, they've all of a sudden got all this set piece contact. They've got all this, they're, they're in possession of the ball. They lay it off and there's a body right in front of them or killing their speed. So it just gives you all that close contact combat stuff that you have to work out physically, I think. Yeah, Scooch, you're, you're spot on there because I think we're probably still lagging slightly behind in, in this country compared to how they've interpreted the rules of football abroad. You know, we were still allowing some tackles, you know, and probably still do at times, and that, that other countries wouldn't. So they've probably had a head start in using the body. I think this is a real opportunity to use your body as a barrier to get in line between the ball and the man and to be able to use that contact. Like you say, it's a sort of blocking off. You're blocking his space off. Um, and that's a sort of uh, clever use of the body and, um, and using the body as a barrier that is another sort of trans transfer from futsal that would be very useful into football. Yeah, so we do like screen runs, blocked runs, blocks. You know, at the high level, when you transfer it into it, it becomes a lot more tactical and you start adding those elements, which you could become different. But then when you look back at um, what I say, look back at the football game in, in, in the end third, you know, I always think it's like two 18-yard boxes having a punch-up together. So when, when the 11 aside puts two 18-yard boxes together and a 5v5, you know, you've got all those different elements. Um, and I just think it's that type of yeah. um, skills and tactics Technical, technical actions for tactical outcomes, if that makes sense. Yeah, so these yeah. technical things that you need to break down a team, and that could be, you know, even playing with a false nine, how do you draw him out? A little bit of a body check, suddenly they're in on goal. You yeah. know, it's those little things, really, those subtleties. I think so. And when you think about it, the most basic way I think about it now is this idea of the complex system of stability, instability, balance, imbalance, and, and flow. So if he's turned and he's in his flow, but you can just step across him or get an arm in and that, that disrupts his flow a little bit, then that's you know, good play within the laws of the game, obviously. And um, where an attacker might be trying to disrupt you by going one way and dodging or, or, or faint, then just the same, the, the, the defender can step across into the line a little bit and disrupt the flow of their movement, yeah. Scoops, um, when we spoke yeah. to Max yesterday, he was talking about playing futsal alongside his football he was saying he played in a, a futsal club and they were playing competitive playing competitive futsal and obviously he ended up playing for the England team how important is it do you think that kids in clubs or wherever are playing competitive futsal rather than you know they might use it in training how different is it if they're going to go and play games how important is that um I love the fact of winning and losing. I think kids do as well, but I think it's more so how we control how important that is. Um, for me, the younger ages, I think kids love competing. I think, you know, going out to compete in futsal is just as important as, as going out to compete in football. Um, but what you want from it, so in the foundation phase, you know, it's more about, you know, the kids getting on the ball, changing the direction, you know, how do they work their way staying on the ball you know how do they play out of pressure you know those types of things and as you move through the phases then I think it gives you real clear tactical feedback um it gives you volume so I think this this thing around because you have rolling subs there's no volume but actually if you were to measure volume in actions how many times you pass a ball how many runs you make how many transitions you make how many 1v1 battles you're in how many 2v2 battles you're in you know you're actually getting a lot of returns in terms of volume of the game and then you can have a rest and re recover, if you like, and go again at high intensity. So I think there's there's loads of different sort of reasons. And I think having two goals and winning and having it as important adds to that responsibility and ownership. Um, whereas if you do it just in training, there's not that, well, we're doing it for training, but there's no outcome, there's no game, it doesn't matter. Um, as soon as you put winning and losing, I think it's it's it's, it's not key, but I think it's it, it adds to that little bit of spice, you know, I don't know about what Call the other guys thoughts, think about that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. The, the, 
the, the, there's massive returns in terms of um, technical and tactical games. I remember the first time we went over to Germany and played, it, you know, you think you're going over to play a five-a-side or a six-a-side, and they were so much more aware tactically than we were. It took us three years, and we actually got to the final. We won the final in the third year because we understood a lot more, even to the extent of, of keeping the ball to play it down so you got the last shot, all these type of things that, you know, are vital in understanding it. And and, and it, what's great about it is you're playing in a tournament, say, you're playing three games in, in a day, the three games the next day or four, and they make a mistake in one of the group games, you know, so they shoot too soon, it hits someone and they, they, they counter-attack away and you get beat in the last second, you know, the last second of the game. So you get back in the dressing room and you're like, well, bloody hell, you know, and they were like, the next game is like, we will, we're not letting that happen again. You know, so then there's that control. And of course, it's the, the physical. The big thing then is, of course, you're tired. So it's the mental control when you're tired uh, is a big thing. And uh, taking the time so they would get the last shot. That, that type of thing was great. And again, it's all under the physical. It's all mixed, you know, yeah. because when you're tired, you make more mistakes. And so all of that comes into it, yeah. But also the competitiveness. You you increase competitiveness and the intensity of play goes up, and that's a really important factor from a physical point of view. So if you really want the players to adapt to be able to develop those powerful actions, the intensity of movement, the speed of the accelerations, the speed of the change of direction, the the amount of force that they put into holding people off, that will all go up if the competitiveness is there. Yeah, I think it's it's that's key. It's not about the winning; it's about the process of trying to win. I think that's the that's what it that's what it brings out. You know, we at the top level we 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 call it scenario training. I don't know if that's the right term. I'm sure football does the same, and I've done it when I've done football bits. But we you know we train in four minute blocks, high intensity, and there's a scenario on that that we obviously do tactical and technical stuff. But it could be, for instance, Matt, it could be you know for four minutes we're going to play four versus five power play. You got to see it out. We'll have tactics, but you've got to see the situation out. Um, and like Paul says, you could be. And many a time we've been in a situation where, you know, Germany in September, we think they were, were there, and then all of a sudden, you know, there's, you know, there's a shot coming in, and you're dead, and you think the game's over, but the clock stops as well. So the laws of the game. So you, you've got you look up and there's 20 seconds on the clock, and you're, you're under the cosh. That could be another four shots you've got to deal with. When in when in a rolling cock situation, you know it doesn't doesn't happen so much. So you, you that's when you get the physical management, the body management, the tactical stuff. You don't want to change on a set piece because if you change with thirty seconds to go, so there's just so much going on in there um, that I think can transfer into the bigger the bigger yeah. game if you like the eleven v eleven. Yeah, one thing we've not mentioned yet is the the physical. Um, the constraints, how they affect the goalkeeping. So definitely the transfer from the football, from futsal to football goalkeeping, there's some great physical returns and, and reaction to uh, um, saves, but also the, the, the specific techniques from angles, shots and so on. So you see someone like uh, David De Gea, definitely, you know, he, he has some of those sort of uh, techniques that futsal goalkeepers would use. So again, it, it would be definitely beneficial, I think, um, I think, I think, yeah, Paul. So just to interject, yeah, don't they? Yeah, yeah. No, just to interject. I think for me, on, on the on the simplest bit around the keeper is, is they take more shots. Mm. So you could be taking fifty shots a game. So as a coach, what an opportunity to work with a goalkeeper. Whether I don't know, I'm not an expert in goalkeeping coaching and what that looks like and the transferable skills. And I know there's some that that our keepers would do certain things and. We really want our keepers to be really good with their feet because sometimes we ask them to come out and play and they'll even have to accelerate out with the ball. So they could be the first transition phase in the game. But I think, the op especially the foundation phase, what an opportunity to coach a young keeper when they're probably going to get 40, 50 shots a game. Are they getting that amount of shots? So, you know, I say for the keepers, Paul, it's it's mm. the same game, different classroom. Yeah, yeah, Absolutely. Guys, I'm conscious of time, but I think we've probably got time to wrap it up and be a good question around the so what. So we've talked quite a bit about futsal. Where does this foot, for, foot fit Sorry, for those trying to fit this into their football practices? Paul, what would be the key things you'd say to take and what would your training sessions look like for as a result for of me, these conversations? For me, I would be looking to play once a week, uh, you know, a session pretty much with all age groups. And I would have um, a block 
in in the middle of the season i would change all all the seasons so that particularly in december and january i would have tournaments all through that season all that part and you know that in that you know each bit there'd be certain technical games that you'd be looking for with the 10s and 10s 11s 12s maybe and then you know the next it steps up because they've got certain moves already automated now it becomes more things you can add in now more and when they get to 18 and so on it's just getting to a higher and higher level so i would have all of those in i think you'd see massive returns because once you won't go outside again you would see the skills that have been developed there and the physical capabilities they would they would just roll off into the next part of the season for the outdoor game and the 11 aside and i i definitely believe both futsal and indoor football are a block of of games because you can go away to a tournament and do it but you don't really know what you're doing and the lessons are best learned when you you go year after year and you have at least three tournaments in a row you have three tournaments inside a month or six weeks four weeks then you'll quickly you'll you'll learn rapidly from it you do one tournament it can be just sort of lost a little bit until you do it again the next time and, and it's not seen as seriously as a learning tool then if it is seen there then you have everybody joined in you have your analyst you have your um obviously if you, you, you're in the pro clubs you'd have your analyst your fitness guy all looking through that lens of the quadrant with the coach and then you'd be identifying strengths and weaknesses for each player and he would be developing his um his his whole strategy for outplaying different opponents yeah now, i was just thinking with the tournament stuff that's got to have a, a physical effect if you're playing how often were you playing Paul? how many how many times a day or how many days in a yeah, row I, I think you can play maybe three times a day depends on the on the uh, length of the games you know i think you have a tournament over a weekend that's normally how it's done when you go to these tournaments abroad um we played in this tournament under 19 tournament in in it was unbelievable in stuttgart mercedes-benz sponsored it you've got you've got it's live on german tv you had four foreign uh, four foreign teams four uh teams from uh germany they had an actual, it's actual football crowd with big massive flags it was incredible atmosphere uh, and then, like you say, the gameplay, they start to get used to that atmosphere. And you imagine 6,000, it was like a like a running track, you know, indoor running track with 6,000 there. So that's like, I would imagine that the atmosphere would be equivalent to 30,000 outside because it's all so close in. Now, if we're building that up over time with regional tournaments and so on, it can only benefit the players in, in every way, all four corners, psychologically, technically, physically. Um, that, that would be my sort of, dream scenario yeah and Matt from a physical perspective playing a number of games in a day or a number of games over a number of days yeah well I think I mean a big element of, of the physical development of the player is exposure to games and 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 teaching the body to play and then play again um, so I, I, and in different formats as well so whether that's 11 v 11 futsal whether that's in a tournament so you've got maybe shorter games that become more often um, it's helping if it's done correctly it's helping the body to adapt to get used to playing more regularly so you know again thinking about what it might look like at the end game for some of these elite players some of them are playing 70 70 plus games a season over you know maybe 70 to 80 games in 12 months so they've got to get used to playing regularly and recovering and then playing again and and, and so that needs to be part of their development and education program as well that's something you're aware of Scoos, when you take teams away for tournaments yeah i think you know like we we talk about um the recovery strategies a lot so if we're talking about the top level we're playing two three games in four days um high intensity some of the players will be playing you know real time sort of 30 up to 30 minutes which in it is, is is a lot of time because the clock stops so you're talking some games last 80 85 minutes so we're not talking they might play 30 minutes but they're playing 30 minutes of high intensity 30 minutes mm. you know with with stimulus like like matt pointed out to earlier that's that's a hard shift and then you go again the next day so you've got to recover and i i think it, it helps build definitely physical robustness and that repetitive you know being able to train and play day after day you know and like um, Matt says, you know, some of the, our, our lads' breaking strength is, is really good, you yeah. know, and that's come from about playing the game. 
Um, so if you were to test some of our lads' breaking strength, you'd be really surprised how, how strong they are in those areas. Yet they've not really done, you know, the sort of running that you would just by running, they've done it by playing, really. So, um, yeah, I think what was the question originally, Parksy? I can't remember because I've been listening to these guys. Uh, it was just about how you manage your players over a course of a period of time. Are you aware of their physical load? I think you mentioned it, really. But do you have to manage them across games? Or? Yeah, it's exactly, it's exactly the same way football would do at the top level. You know, how you do your sort of performance services to, to manage your load, how you plan your load. The other good thing around it is that we can, from a coaching perspective, we can manage the load on the bench. So I, I you know, I probably, it sounds really, I work really hard on the bench, a bit like a basketball coach where I'm asking how long they've been on. I know their cliff. I know when players are getting tired. So one of the, our testings we do, similar to football I also want to know how quickly they recover so I know Parksy you took about six minutes to recover <laughs> however I had other players that could do the same as you and take about 30 seconds to recover so I knew I could I could get it's just, it, you know you, you didn't know that Parksy did you so no I probably well, did I knew, I knew because I was like yeah. Ah. <laughs> yeah yeah so but I mean like so I so you know you, you sort of at the highest level you have all that input around the physical bit as well because you want to get you know, it sounds like you want to get your players back on court who can do certain jobs for you. So if you're losing the game, you need to get your players on court that you think are going to go and get that goal back. If you're winning the game, you need to get your players on court and then rest them. And you've even got the management while well, we've got 12 minutes left. I know you can do uh, two stints, but I know it takes you six minutes to recover. How am I going to manage you and help you through that game? Because you're not going to last 12. You're going to die. So there's all those elements. Just to flip back to, I think, the, the question before, part A was about how would you put it into a football programme? Um, and there's, there's, there's three key pillars for me, and it links to, to both the guys and Paul especially, is properly embed it. The success I've seen across the pro game and it's starting to move is how you properly embed it. And what I mean by that is, you know, it might it might be a bit harder to do it properly, i.e. get the goals, the ball, the surface and the constraints right, but you're going to get so much more returns from it. Do it weekly because I think it will challenge your players and also your coaching staff. Um, and if you do it weekly, it's not just a flash in the pan. And it doesn't have to be every day weekly, but I've seen some really good models in the pro game at the minute where they have um, like a dual age coming in every Friday night and the coaches are from the grass, but they have a futsal expert wrapped around them, if you like, and they, they sort of do it together. But what I mean by embedding it is it, it works with your curriculum. You know, what you're learning that week, maybe you could go in and indoors and it, it comes back to my point around same game, different classroom. You know, you're trying to educate this holistic player around having <clears> tools. Well, don't see it as a, a difference. See it as how I can do it. So if you're looking at the goalkeeper at that point, well, how could you educate him in the same thing you want to outfield? And then on the Friday night, just talk to him about certain things in foot cell that help. And then as you go through the pathway, I think it can be more beneficial to be helping position specific. So like if you've got a, I don't know, a number four, well, put them in an environment where you can't make fouls or you've got to be able to face forward to play forward or play them at the back in futsal and ask them to not go back to the keeper and they've got to find those hips open. They've got, to, you know, or a forward as a number nine, we'd call a pivot, put them in that position specific, but but make sure it marries up with what you're trying to achieve as them as a football, holistic football development player, really. Yeah. yeah, I think Parks as well is, is that variety in the games programme where you know that certain games are going to get you certain returns and certainly futsal does that. And of my experience at Manchester United, you're talking about players who play in the World Cup final, Paul Pogba, um, uh, Jesse Lingard, uh, Marcus Rashford. Their, their programme, well, on a Monday we had a game in a cage which is actually 13 aside, but that was to get a lot of chaos and a lot, a lot of... Um, of short, sharp movements and perception. And um, then we would have a five-a-side, um, which was at the start of the warm-up for them. So they did that at least two, three times a week. And then we'd get to Wednesday, they're a little bit tired, and we played a form of futsal um, on, a, on a basketball court with benches for goals. And they were a little bit tired, having done probably three days, double sessions. But we'd say, go on, we gave them 20 minutes, half an hour. And I can only tell you the skills that came out in those sessions were just incredible because it was also a session where we, we let the atmosphere be light. Um, but some of the things they were doing um, were, were just amazing. And the floor helps that. And we actually played that game with a with a, not a futsal ball, but with a lively ball. So it was even more, you know, even harder. Um, so the variety within within the... It's not just for variety purpose. The purpose is to 
highlight certain technical and physical returns that you want. And then, of course, we did all the normal training, but they were a definite core part of the development of the players. And, and I, I watch games and I think, yeah, that's something that he definitely got in that, you know, he definitely he got in those situations. Yeah, and, and, and you know, from the, the physical point of view in terms of what it brings to your football programme, it drives that game pace and it gives the, op the opportunity for players to practice their high-speed skills and become more effective at, at those at the decisions and then the execution of the high speed skills and it develops the body to be able to you know thrive in those high intensity higher intensity elements of the game um so it, it has real value in terms of uh, the physical corner development parksy can i ask paul a question if that's all right yeah of course yes paul i'm just interested you know because we're talking about the player development but as a mm. coach when you went indoors yeah, did futsal. How, how did that? I don't know. I want to say open your eyes or change your eyes because I think you know some <laughs> yeah. things that when I've coached football and then obviously now more specialized in futsal, yeah. some of the things I have to deal with and the speed is, you know, yeah, how does it you know? So for the coaches there listening as well, how can it help them? Yeah, a lot of coaches maybe wouldn't go. We went and it was a tricky time a year to go, went just after the Christmas break, just before the youth cup. So we were going into an indoor tournament, which which sort of reduced our outdoor preparation for the youth cup. So it was a bit of a risk. But I thought the gains were going to be more. Now, little did I know how much the gains were going to be for me as a coach. I mean, after the first day of the first tournament, we were in the bar just having a drink and it was like, a kaleidoscope going round my head and <laughs> like from jungle book, you know, your eyes going like this. I was like, oh my God, there were so many things, that, so many things to think about that we weren't good at, that we had to learn about that game and that they were so much better than us. So then we went away. We actually spoke to a, I met a guy there from Schalke who's, um, um, who's, who's produced so many top players uh, at Schalke and, and he was... He was talking to say, well, it's a game of no mistakes, you know, yeah. in that sense, you have to be really perfect in everything that you're doing. And we started to learn the next year we got to the semi-final, but I also had a very sort of humbling experience where well, Miss Nicky Bock was with us and we, we were we were in a position where we could lose a game 1-0 and still go through. And I never, ever experienced this in all, you know, it was always like, well, we've got to win. And you know, it's like if you chase the goalkeeper, if you go behind impress them then that's a very difficult position to be in isn't it in indoor football so they've got an extra man effectively so we were also playing grasshoppers of zurich who only needed to win one nil and they they scored we said well we're just back off to the halfway line just keep it tight you know we, we can lose one nil but we're trying to win you know but we're not going to press them but they scored just before half time and i didn't know hadn't been in this position before you know in a, in a sense so we so, said, well, we'll just, we'll just stay, you know. Uh, and and they, what they did is just kept passing the ball in their own half. And we were too frightened to go in, in their half. And it, it was a bit of a standoff. You remember the Germans and Austrians in the World Cup that time, both playing out a draw. So we did that. And, it, and it's happened for a minute or so. And the crowd, 6,000 crowd start whistling and booing and going on. And we're like, should we press? Shouldn't we? we weren't quite ready. And then we pressed and they nearly scored. And it was like the whole crowd's whistling. We went through on a draw. We both went through on a draw. And it was the worst feeling I've ever had as a coach, you know, thinking we've gone against all our principles here. And um, it, was, it was very humbling. Afterwards, we said to the players, well done, you know, discipline. You might have to have that in a, if you if you were playing in a playoff or something. But it felt terrible. And um, uh, later on, the, the, the German coach, I spoke to him. He said, "Well, he didn't really seem like you that," and I, I felt awful. So we, we eventually we we sent a letter of apology to the tournament and and to the other teams really because it wasn't <laughs> really you know what we but, did. But, massive learning experience. So it's a long story, yeah. but but yeah. Basically, yeah, I think you get put into situations you've never been yeah. in before if you put if you go for it, and then you will yeah. learn so much on and off the field. Yeah. Yeah, and detail and management and game management. That's what, yeah, it's, it's a good little story. But I think there's loads going on for the coach in their part. Yeah, loads. taking people off at your own corner and things like that, you're just not used to, you know, making subs, all sorts of daft things that you learn um, that are fantastic learning opportunity if you throw yourself into it, yeah. Good stuff. 
Guys, it's been an absolute pleasure listening to you. Thanks for all your wisdom and bringing your experiences to the call. That's really good. Um, for me, I just think the speed of the game, number of repetitions, repetition without repetition, the players are going to get so much um, physically, technically, and as we've heard across the four corners as well. So thanks so much for your time, guys. Matt, Scoobs, Paul, um, thanks for your time. Cheers, Thank you.